So let's get started. Um, like I said, usually the classes, you know, we schedule from one to three, but we'll probably be done before three unless there's a lot of questions or something like that. Um, but majority of the stuff we talk about is going to be in your resources folder. So when you log into the resources folder, same with working for buy with buyers, there's a working with sellers folder. Um, so if we open this up, you're going to see a whole bunch of different seller files as well as um, a system for working with sellers. So this is the system that I've always used in the past in regard to, you know, what the process is for your timeline, for preparing everything the seller needs, going on your listing presentation, what a listing presentation should look like. And we're going to talk about that a little because there's different types of listing presentations, um, as well as then obviously marketing and promoting your actual listing and how to handle and navigate your sellers because you know they can be challenging at times um now obviously with the covid and what we're dealing with right now we're the conversation's going to change a little because we're going to be talking more about how to do things on a virtual level um versus just their traditional person to person approach right so we'll have to we'll have to pivot a little bit but that's okay um so i mean with sellers, there's kind of a couple of different ways you can get your leads, right? Um, traditionally, our cold calling and our door knocking um, are more directed at sellers or even ad mail and farming and things like that. That's our more traditional way of building up our seller database. Um, again, not being able to do that right now creates a bit of a challenge. However, you know, you can still, some people are having great success with online leads. Um, and running advertisements for current listings and things like that to generate leads that way. Um, and then beyond that, truthfully, it's, it's all coming from database at the moment from what we're hearing. It's people referring people to you because you know what to do or you're doing a good job or you've done something gone out of the way to help them or it's who you know. So right now our business is very much dependent on our databases as you've heard us say numerous times. Um, and obviously that's still the main focal point is just keeping in touch with and, and to touching base with everybody that you know and are aware of um, so that if they do need something, if they do need to list their home or they do need to sell their home, you're going to be available and they're going to know how to get a hold of you. And that includes social media. So, you know, some people are hesitant right now to post on social media. And I do agree that what we're posting, it's important to have the right content and approach it the right way we don't want to be posting from a point of view of you know if you're thinking about buying or selling it's harder to do that right now because a lot of people just aren't in that mindset however you do want to kind of have consistent posting just regarding what's going on in the market or you know learning about how to do virtual tours services you can offer people and just in general being there to help and support people in any other way right reaching out to other businesses supporting those businesses letting them know you're there for them there's lots of stuff we can do to still try to generate some business but you know we have to be realistic that it's going to be a little bit less right now than what we would have wanted in our spring market unfortunately um, but it gives us time to get ready for when we get busy again. So when you do kind of go through that lead generation process and you get a lead, a listing lead, um, the beginning portion of this is relatively the same as the buyer. So you're still going to call the person who referred them to you if it's a referral, and you're gonna obviously thank them for that referral, however that looks, sending them a nice email, mailing them a card. Some people are saying, you know, don't mail anything in the actual mail right now because people are uncomfortable receiving mail. So that's a choice you can make. Um, but at the very least an email with potentially, you know, a little gift card or something in there to say, hey, thanks for that referral. And then the next thing you're gonna do is call that referral and touch base with them and communicate. So the key to referrals um, is when someone gives you a referral, they've already told the person that they're going to give you the information right they're not kind of giving you the referral and then going hey yeah call them whenever you have a minute they've already come, spoken to that person they've already gotten permission to share that person's information with you and share their situation with you um and if you take too long to call back that's already automatically a bit of a, a negative reflection on yourself right so when someone gives you a referral 
and you after you call the referrer and thank them for that if you're not already on the phone with them you should be calling that referral pretty much immediately to touch base hey how's it going i just got your information from caesar i wanted to reach out and introduce myself i'm jennifer i work at keller williams caesar mentioned that you were thinking about this so you need to help with that or whatever that might be and i just wanted to touch base and see if we can set up a time to chat more about that it's a very simple script, but you need to do it within a short window of time because you got to remember that that's their first impression of you and they're already anticipating your call. So the longer you take, the more it's going to reflect on you. Obviously, the next steps are put them into your database, put them onto any drip campaign or system that you have running in your database, and then you want to book your appointment with them. You want to book time to sit down and speak with them. Now, again, very similar to working with a buyer you're going to book the appointment you're going to book it at least a couple of days out from the day you speak with them because you need time to do some preparation get your materials put together get prepared for the appointment um and then you also want to call them and pre-qualify them um, to make sure that they are in the position that you think they are and that you know they know what they want and so going back to the last week's training talking about pre-qualifying and the questions we should be asking they're pretty straightforward questions, right? What have you done so far? Are you working with another realtor? When do you need to have the home sold? And do you need to buy another property? When do you need to be in that property? And the reason we ask all those questions up front is A, to validate that they're a, a real lead, like we've always discussed, and, and it's worth going on the appointment. But it's also so we can prepare our conversation that we're gonna have with them the next day and make sure that we bring all the information that's going to work for them that they're going to need to hear. Um, now, before we get into the actual appointment or the actual, as I call it, conversation, but let's say consultation, um, we also have to talk a little bit about the different types of presentations. So traditionally, we had two different types. We had a one step and we had a two step. The one step was that you completed the CMA you prepared all the paperwork, you have your presentation, your breakdown of your marketing plan, your you know, staging stuff set up, your costs and your commission conversation ready, and then you ask them to sign the paperwork at the end of the meeting. A lot of, most agents couldn't actually do that presentation at a high level. That's a great presentation if you're a high D personality. Um, the reason for that being it's very direct, it's very concise, it's to the point and high D's on the other side like that type of presentation as well. Um, if you're more of a high I personality, more of a people person, you're more friendly, you're more relationship based, you're probably more likely going to do a two-step appointment, which is what most agents do. The two-step was it traditionally that we would go to the house, we would walk around, we would spend about half an hour, meet the people, take a look, take notes on the property, the condition, the upgrades, learn a little bit about the street, the neighbors, ask whatever questions we need to meet. And then we would book our follow-up appointment where we would come back with our completed CMA, our marketing strategy, all of that stuff and have them sign the paperwork at that point. So I would say probably 70% of agents did a two-step and probably 30% do a one-step. And it doesn't matter which one you do, it's just a preference thing. So for me, for example, I like a two-step and the reason for that is not because I can't do a one step, I could. Um, and if I was meeting with a high D personality, I probably would do it that way. Um, but the reason is that I believe in seeing the home before I do a market analysis or a CMA on it, because I need to know what the home looks like, what upgrades they've done, how it shows, what the street is like, and all of that information in order to, to really believe that I can price their home accordingly and properly. Um, and so I would go in also I because I'm relationship based. I like the rapport building element of it So I would do that as well um, And realistically speaking Most of the time that was very very effective by the time I went back the second time Went through everything and had the paperwork ready to present to them. They already they'd already met me twice We'd spoken on the phone twice. They know me a little bit better. There's a bit more trust there It's easier to get them to sign the paperwork at that point um, obviously with the climate today, we're doing all of this virtually now. So it is a little bit different. Now you can still do a one step or a two step process. They just look different. The one step now is obviously going to be that you're going to call them. 
and you're going to have them, you know, take their phone and walk you through the house and do a, or their laptop and do like a FaceTime video or a Google Hangout video or do a recording of the home and talk, talk about the house and point out, you know, features and things like that and then send you that or you would be on that call with them and that would be your first step. And then your second step would be just like this where we would do a Zoom webinar or whatever program you choose to use, have the same conversation, the same presentation, and then electronically email them the paperwork at the end, right? So you would have, for example, this sort of content, not obviously this checklist, this is for us, but you'd have your listing package and you'd have your marketing plan and you'd have your CMA and you would have it all saved as a PDF or whatever that looks like. And you would just share your screen with them and you would go through ask them all the questions that we would normally ask and you know go through a listing presentation process which we'll get to in a second um, the only other real big step that you need to get done here prior to your final kind of conversation meeting is your cma um, same thing for the buyers we talked about that right so make sure that you understand how to do a cma properly what that looks like how to properly price a home how to make the adjustments you need to make, how to read market watch and know what's going on in the market and talk about the stats properly because that's the meat and potatoes of the conversation. That's what most people want to know. So obviously we have CMA classes and all of that and we will go over how to do that highly effectively. Um, but that's a skill that you need to be working on right now. So any questions about that before we move on? Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. So, Jan, quick question. Is it uh, when the seller in Ignite? Yeah, when the seller is in Ignite. It's what we're doing today, basically, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's my version of it. Like, it's yeah, what yeah, I, yeah. I do. Okay. But yeah, we're talking about working with sellers. Yeah. When the seller. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, through this, are we going to learn how to actually make a listing presentation as well? Well, I'm going to show you what a listing presentation will look like and the process okay. and the steps and all of that. Like you're to, when you say make a listing presentation, we don't really make one. We just kind of have some deliverables that we can bring with us, but the presentation is our conversation with the client. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are, okay. I'll show you the resources you have and there are PowerPoints and stuff you can use, but those are just like accompanying tools. They're not really, you're not meant to rely on those they're just there as, as secondary support right okay like some agents they actually make a whole like kind of like a booklet yeah like, go through the whole thing is that what you're talking about as well yeah kind of yeah um that some agents do the agents do it at different levels some agents do real fancy and they go through it page by page and it's a whole big like it's pretty much their whole presentation um some agents do more most agents do more what i do where i have those deliverables i bring them with me i review the certain pages that are pertinent to the situation but i'm not sitting there going through the book page by page because it's it's boring truthfully right so um and some agents will do it on an ipad or a, a laptop or do a slideshow presentation that's up to you how you choose you want the content to look but all the content is the same for most agents Sure. So we're going through more of the content and what the conversation should be. Okay. Okay. Um, so what happens after the appointment um, and you do your, so obviously after the first walkthrough, you were going to then go back. We're going to set up our time for our second appointment if you're doing a two-step, right? So at that appointment, and this goes to your question, Najim, um, at that second appointment, what we're going to be bringing with us, or in some cases, agents actually send stuff in advance. Um, and that's what you call, you'll hear people say a pre-listing package. So a pre-listing package is basically the same as a listing presentation package, except that it's sent in advance of the meeting. So some agents will do it that they'll ask them to review the package before they get there so that they have a lot of the information and they've reviewed it. And then they can kind of just go into like the main conversational pieces. Some agents will um, not send the full package, but there'll be a questionnaire or additional information that they want to get from the client, such as, you know, all their contact information, um, 
their financial situation, like what do they owe on the mortgage, all that sort of stuff. Are they buying? If they are buying, where do they need to go? What does that house look like? What their wish list might be, stuff like that. So that stuff they would then would get emailed and they would ask to complete it prior to the agent showing up. So when we hear pre-list presentation, it's kind of confusing because everyone thinks it's this one thing that's been built and there's a copy of it and we can all just use the same thing. But the reality is every agent does it a little differently and there's no real, you know, right or wrong. Like you could easily use the quick pages app, for example, and make a pre-listing video, which is a video of you saying, you know, talking about yourself, giving a little bit of background on the business and what you do and Keller Williams and all that fluff conversation and then attaching a couple of documents you're going to ask them to have completed and at the table when you get there the next day. That's an example of a pre-list, right? Another example of a pre-list is literally a PDF package that has all of your information in it, including your marketing plan that you would send in advance of the meeting for them to review prior to your meeting. That's another example of a pre-list. Some people have a courier to the person's house. Um, so you know, I know as newer agents, everyone wants to be handed, like, here's the actual content. This is what you use. But the reality is, if you ask 10 agents, they'll all give you something different. It, you have to figure out what you like, what you don't like. Do you want it to be technology-based? Do you want it to be paper-based? Um, obviously, right now, everything should be more electronic. So then, you know, what, what are you sending in advance? What are you bringing with you? So you have to kind of figure out what you want that to look like. Um, Personally, I don't actually, I don't do a pre-list at all. Um, I have my, my qualification conversation with them the day before on the phone. And I ask them any questions I need to ask them at that point and I get the information I want. Um, not because I don't think they work, just not, it's never been something I've personally done because I know I'm gonna go over that content when I meet them and I don't wanna be redundant. That being said, a lot of agents like it because not, not every agent does it. So it kind of can help set them apart from everybody else in regard to uh, what they're sending and standing out a little bit, looking more professional. So you just have to make that decision for yourself, what you want that to look like. Um, there are samples of pre-list packages on kw.com as well as on command. But if you actually look at the listing package and the pre-list package, they're the same thing. So any other questions about that before we move on? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna go out into the resources folder and I'm gonna kind of show you some examples of the listing presentation and what that can look like. So if you go into your listing presentation folder, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, you're gonna see, this is an actual outline of a listing presentation. So the order of the conversation, the process, what you talk about step by step. And you can literally follow this verbatim if you want to. Um, even all the prep work is listed here at the beginning, how to do a CMA. It's all outlined in this, in this little list. Um, and then it's gonna show you on page two when you're actually at the presentation. So I'm sorry, my internet's really slow today, so just bear with me, but on page one, is basically a walkthrough of getting prepared for the presentation, what you should bring to the presentation, what you should know, you know, how to kind of enhance your knowledge around everything before you get there, like using doing your CMA, putting together your listing package. So here's an example, what your listing package should include. So when I went to a house or when I go to a house, I include a seller's guidebook, which is kind of the listing package in itself, your business cards, sampling marketing pieces so they can see what my marketing material looks like, including examples of Facebook ads and Instagram ads, things like that. My marketing plan, the step-by-step -step process of that, a little bit of information about myself, an outline of the selling process and a sample of a listing schedule so that they know what to expect, right? I also have all my forms prepared and ready, filled out and ready to be signed. Um, and I've done my research on the local market. I know the stats. I know the recent sales. I know the homes that have been currently listed and are on the market. When we were when we were going and viewing homes, one of my steps would be that before I ever went on a presentation, I would go and walk through every house in that neighborhood that was listed, so that I could get a feel for the properties when they because they know 
right? Your clients know, they know exactly, they've been to those homes, they've gone to the open houses, they've done whatever they need to do because they've been thinking about this. So I would go and do that research as well because I'm the professional in the room, I need to be more knowledgeable than the rest of them, right? Would you um, do that before the presentation or after? Before the presentation. Yeah, like the day before, or two days before or something when I had some time or I would make time and I would pull up on Stratus. Um, I would do like a, a map search of the area and I would kind of pick a radius um, of that particular community. Like I'm not gonna go to all the new market, obviously, but if they're in Huron Heights, I would look at all the available listings in Huron Heights, right? And then I would go and walk through, I would book in agent inspections and in all the properties and I would go walk through them. Um, and I would make notes too, right? Bring, I would bring listings with me and I would actually write notes on the houses. You know, great lot, ravine, you know, great condition, fully renovated, walk out from the basement, in-ground pool or crappy street, hydro lines beside it, cross the road from a school, whatever notes that help me remember it because A, they help me do my CMA at a higher level. B, they help me learn the neighborhood so my market knowledge increased, but C, when I was speaking to the clients about them, I could draw on my notes to refresh my memory. I didn't have to memorize everything, right? And then the next section of this outline is basically what your presentation looks like, what the process is, the order of it. So I, this is the way that I went through it. And this is how I, I still to this day have and still do all of my listing presentations. You're gonna notice it's actually very similar to the buyer consultation, except that I talk a little bit more because we have to talk more in the listing presentation. So for example, at the beginning when I get there, I spend a little time chatting with them. I build rapport, I break the ice, I ask them how they've been, how is work, what's going on with the world, how are the kids, whatever that is, because it's relationship-based, right? I don't get there and jump right into the presentation. Majority of the time, um, listing presentations are done at the, pro at the property, so I would be at the person's house. The one tip I will give you is always do it at the dining room table or the kitchen table because it just allows you to stay more in control um, and you have the, the surface to spread out your materials and you can sit across from them directly so you can mirror and match their body language. Um, and it just, it helps with the presentation. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, let's just sit in the living room. Let's just sit here in the sunroom, whatever that looks like. And that's fine, they mean well, um, but it should always be at the table. So I always insist on that, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, if you go in and they offer you coffee or tea or whatever, water, take it, say yes, even if you don't want it. Um, the reason for that is because they want to be good hosts psychologically. Um, and if we say no and we, we don't take what they offer, you know, you could say, you know what, I'm really not a big coffee drinker, but I'd love some water or something like that if you want to. Um, but when we don't take what they offer, it implies that we're not planning on staying that long, first of all, which can throw some people off. Um, and it also removes their ability to feel as comfortable as they might if you accepted the item. So sounds a bit weird. It's a little bit of psychology, but honestly, that's a big tip I could give you. And I will tell you, I am not a coffee drinker. I don't like coffee at all. And the amount of coffees I've drank at like 7 and 8 p.m. at night because of this is ridiculous. But, you know, it, it also, they usually have a coffee. It's a comfort thing for them. And they're not going to want to have it if you don't want it. So they're going to not have that, you know, comfortable setup going on. So always, always keep that in mind, okay? Um, similar to with the buyers, when we buy the drinks or we buy the snacks at the, at the coffee house, in this instance, as hosts, they are going to offer something to us. So just make sure at the very least, if you really don't want that coffee or whatever, then um, ask for water. The other rule I have is obviously sometimes, and this happens, I've been offered glasses of wine or beers or things like that. That's a big no-no, right? We're professionals. Get the job done meet with them, have the conversation, and then you can have your drink later or something like that. Um, if it's a friend or a family member and you feel a little bit more relaxed, you could choose to do it, but I still truthfully say no until I'm done and then I'll have a drink with them at the end if they really insist on it. So, and the only reason for that is because I like to maintain that professionalism in the process um, and, and 
as much as they're my friend and all of that, I'm still, we're still there to work. We're still there to do our job, right? So you don't want to get too relaxed or be too flippant about something that, and then you might overlook something or miss something. You, no matter who it is you're speaking to, you want to give them the same level of service and professionalism as anybody else that you would speak to. So um, just a little side note on that. After I've kind of spent a little time chatting with them and stuff, um, if I haven't already done the first step, for example, like this is part of the reason I do the first step separately. I don't want them to give me a tour of the home necessarily because it can take forever, especially if it's a high I personality, because honestly, they're going to talk forever and they're going to tell you stories about where they bought the knickknack in the corner and whatever something the kid did in the bedroom 10 years ago. And, you know, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I'm not there for that. Right. I'm trying to get through the rest of the content and I don't want to be there for like three hours. So usually that first having that first step where you do the tour at that point eliminates this step. But if you are doing a one step, then after you've kind of broken the ice and chatted a little bit, take a tour of the home. But what I would recommend is that you go on the tour by yourself. And the way you can do that is with a script. So you could just say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, the next step is for me just to take a quick walk around the home. And they might say, oh yeah, no problem, we'll show you. And what you can say is one of two things. If you have information or questionnaire, or something you want them to fill out, you could say, actually, you know what, if you don't mind, while, um, I'm, while you're filling this out, I'll just give myself a quick tour. That's one way you can do it. Or you could just say, you know what, I actually prefer if it's okay with you that I do this part myself because I like to walk through the home as if I'm the buyer and take notes of all of the features and details that a buyer might pick up on so I can better help you prepare the home for the market. So I'll be really quick, maybe about five, 10 minutes and I'll be right back with you. But in the meantime, you can take a look at the listing package that I've brought or something like that, right? That way, you're kind of in control of your timeline and you're not dealing with getting that long winded tour of the home and all the extra features. Um, and then usually what I did from there, once I got back, I would take lots of notes of the house as well um, from a staging perspective, as well as from, you know, a CMA perspective, if I haven't completed a CMA at this point. Um, and then I would start talking to the sellers about the local market and getting an idea of, what their expectations are. So I'm not going to talk to them about their specific home at this point. I'm going to talk to them more generically. Here's what's happening in new market. Here's what we're seeing. Here's what happened over the last month. Prices went up by this much. We had, you know, 20 homes come on the market. We have, we had 30 homes sell. We're in a seller's market, whatever that might look like. Um, and then get an idea of if they've been looking at the market and if they have an expectation of the value of the home of, the, of their home. Um, and the reason I ask this question is because I want to know what their expectations are. Not because I'm going to agree with them because 99% of the time they're wrong. Um, but purely because I want to know, are they in within reason of value or are they way off the mark? Right? So, you know, if you're at a house that's worth a million dollars and they think it's worth 1.2, I know I'm going to have to have a hard conversation with them when I get to that CMA. Right? So it gives me an idea. I don't ask them to price their home. I don't give them the option to price their home. I just ask them if they have an idea of what they're expecting their home to sell for. Uh, after that, then I ask them what their plan is, right? If we go back to the four W's. When do they need to sell? Where are they going? What's their reason for selling? When do they need to have their home sold by? What are they looking for in a, in a, a real estate representative? What are the main things that are important to them? And the reason I'm asking for that is obviously because I can tailor my myself and my behaviors to that, but also because that's important to them and you want them to feel heard. So by the time I get to this point, I just stop talking. I ask them the questions, I let them answer, and then I take notes and I let them talk a lot in this section. I let them tell me exactly what they need. I let them get really comfortable opening up to me, talking to me about their motivations, their reasons for selling what they want out of an agent, what's important to them, what they like, what they don't like. And it gets kind of, it can get kind of personal. So you just got to let them go through that part. The thing about this section though, is that when you let them do that, they really start to trust you at a higher level. And they, that wall starts to break down. And because you're letting them talk and you're listening to what they're saying, they're feeling heard. 
which validates them, which helps with them in liking you faster. And then the more they like you, the more likely you are to get the job, truthfully. So um, once we've gone through that section and I've chatted with them about all of that and I've let them talk and get it all out and, you know, I've had presentations where that's taken a long time because it's been an extremely emotional situation. And I've had presentations where that's taken about three minutes because, you know, they bought their condo, they got married, they're pregnant and they need more space. And that's the conversation. So it just depends, right? Um, then the next step after that, once we've gone through that whole thing is that I then go through what I do for my clients, what the marketing plan is for the property, what my process is, how I get the property sold, what sort of online promotions I do, open houses, neighborhood promotions, basically my marketing plan. Um, and my marketing plan generally was about a two week marketing plan that I had and it was exact and it was the same for every single property. And I'll show that to you in a minute as well. But that would be the next step. And then I would also share with them the samples of my marketing pieces so that they could see what those look like. You know, my feature sheets, my flyers, my wine and cheese invitations, my Facebook ads, stuff like that. Um, and I, I did all this on paper before anyone asked that as well. So I would just kind of screenshot the images of my Facebook ads and I would print those. So that's how I would share those. Um, and then the next step for me when I did it would be discussing staging. So obviously, this can look a little bit different depending on your process. I did a lot of staging with my clients. So I would actually do the walkthrough with them almost like a consultation, let them know what they needed to do, get the house, do the painting, fix the landscaping, declutter, so on and so forth. And then I would go back and actually help them rearrange their furniture and do things like that before the photographer went through the property. Um, so I, I kind of included staging to an extent as part of my process because I, I knew how to do it. But you might have a stager coming in. So in that case, you might kind of run through more of a checklist of what the stager is going to expect or what things they can do prior to the stager being able to actually stage the home, such as depersonalizing, cleaning, all that sort of stuff, and give them an idea of what that, what that might cost or, or the timeline on that, how long that might take them depending on what they want to do. If they want to renovate a kitchen, you know, then you've got a, a longer timeline than if they're just going to declutter and depersonalize the house. And then you might choose to offer a consultation um, as part of your package. You might choose to include staging completely. That's up to you. There's different price points based on all of that stuff naturally. So you have to know what you're looking to spend and what your budget is and what the price point of the house is. And you might have it within your own system on the back end that different price points you, because of you, what your income would look like, different price points, you are going to offer different services. That's very plausible as well. I wouldn't do that personally because somebody who sells an $800,000 house might refer you a $400,000 condo. And then you're going to provide a different level of service to the condo than you would the $800,000 house. Um, and if they know each other and they discuss that, then that might not go over very well. So realistically, you kind of should have one set plan for every property. And that's a decision that you make based on your numbers, if you want to include those costs or not. What do um, you usually do, Jen? Like, do you usually um, include it or do you not include it? Like, if, say you don't include it, then won't they say, oh, well, this other agent is including it? Yeah, so like I was saying before, I, I kind of do include it. Um, but I don't usually bring in a professional stager. I usually kind of do it for them or with them because I know how to do it, right? Because it's just, awesome. once you've been doing it long enough, you kind of figure it out. Um, but if I was, if I, if I had an, another agent that I knew, if they were meeting with another agent and that agent was offering them staging, then I would probably offer them staging as well. And if I didn't know how to do it at a high level, I would get into a relationship with a stager and offer staging most likely because it makes a big difference for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a significant cost. So you have to find somebody who either you can pay on the property once it closes, or that's going to give you a discount because you're going to use them for every property. Right? So that's, that's getting into relationship with your trades. How much would you say like typically on average uh, a stager would cost? Um, depends on the stager. They are all over the place. Um, as as consultation, so a lot of a lot of agents do is they offer a free consultation, which means the, a stager will go into the house, do the walkthrough, give them their feedback, 
let them know, hey, this is what needs to be done. And then the, the seller could then choose to hire the stager or not hire the stager. And the agent would cover the cost of the consultation, which is anywhere from 250 to $400, depending on the stager, right? Um, if you're doing a full house staging, I've had, I have had stagers that I know of who can, if it's say it's like a 2,000, 2,500 square foot home, that could be about three grand to stage that house. And I know some stages that would maybe charge eight or $900. So it really truthfully depends on the stager um, and how much they're charging and what their model is. So it's a little bit of an all over the board type situation. Unfortunately, it's about, it's really about reaching out to the different stagers and finding who you like and someone you're willing to pay their fees. Do they usually bring like, or do, do they usually use the stuff that are in the house already or do they bring their own like kind of stuff to stage the house? So again, it's going to depend. Um, it's going to depend on the stager and it's going to depend on what's in the house. So I've had stages do both and they'll charge less if they use more of the seller's own furniture um, because you're not paying that what they call their rental fee for the furniture, right? But I've also had stagers basically say, empty it out. I, we're going to come in and stage the whole thing with their own furniture. So, because they wanted to have that more modern feel, but usually those stagers who are doing that, they're also painting and including all of that in their fees, right? Um, and oh. then some, some stagers will have the seller do all the painting and all the prep work and get the house ready. And then they'll just come in and remove the, the, the seller's furniture. Some stagers will store it, some stagers won't. Depends on the stager. Um, and then they'll bring in their own furniture and some stagers will work with the seller's prop furniture as much as possible. And then just bring in the pieces that need to be brought in to fill the gaps, like artwork and lamps and maybe a chair here, table there, something like that. So that's why I'm saying, unfortunately, it's really about the stager that you get it's not really you know there isn't cookie cutter for a stager there's not one size fits all they do things very differently um and there's no regulation to it there's no rhyme or reason to it it's just it is what it is so it just depends on who you choose to work with mm -hmm. now some some agents will um actually charge a higher commission so say they'll charge a six percent fee or something like that but they'll take care of everything. They'll have the house painted, they'll have it fully staged, they'll include it as part of their proposition to the seller, um, and they cut they cover the cost with that additional percentage point or a percentage and a half or whatever that's gonna be for them. So that goes back to, again, being a business decision for you to make, right? What do you wanna spend? What do you wanna offer? What do you think is the most value? What do you think is gonna help you win presentations? Um, and what do you think makes sense for you? And the only way to make that decision is A, by knowing what you are and aren't capable of doing yourself, and then looking at your budgets and your numbers, right? Makes sense? Yeah, sorry, it does make sense, yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. So basically, once you've run through the, you know, staging part of things and what they could do and couldn't do um then then we kind of get into the final steps you'll notice that my kind of last conversation with them is price and there's two reasons for that one is because if i don't know them very well and i give them the price right up front they're not going to listen to anything else i say at all for the rest of the meeting so i just i make them wait um, and the other reason is that I also want to make sure they understand the value that I'm providing them before I give them a price point because I don't want them to just be, I want them to understand that I'm providing staging, what my marketing looks like, how much I'm investing into them. And then we get into their actual price and their, their, what my CMA is and what I would recommend that they list their home for. Now, the thing about this though, is that usually when you do your listing presentation, it's going to be a couple of weeks before you actually go on the market, sometimes longer. It could be two weeks, could be a month. My rule is it's a minimum of two weeks. I would not list anything with less than a two week window because we need time to prepare. I need time to get my marketing together. I need time to do whatever staging the, or whatever needs to happen at the house. The seller needs time to declutter. If I take a listing tomorrow and they want to put it up on Monday, I'm not going to have time to get that done. So I'm not going to be able to roll out my marketing plan the way I know it works at a high level. 
Um, so I won't do that. I'm a minimum of two weeks. If they're just, you know, if they're pretty well staged and ready to go, um, and it's just my marketing and getting that prepared, there'll be that two week window without any question. But if they need time to declutter and stuff, it's more likely going to be a month before they're on the market. In which case I would probably have them sign an exclusive for that month window so that I can still promote the property as a coming soon, put the sign up, um, run ads online and do things like that with it in the meantime. So, if, so Jen, when, yeah. like, I feel kind of stupid just cause I'm so new to it, but that's like, okay. what if that's, someone that's is, what we're here for. Yeah, like what if someone is uh, still living in the house, right? And they're like decluttering, depersonalizing it. Are you only doing that just um, for the photography alone or what, like, how do, how do you go by mm -hmm. when somebody's like, living in the property itself yeah that's a great question um they have to live like that <laughs> truthfully they're you okay. know they they pare down they declutter they only keep the clothes that they need um they're they keep the house very minimal they have to keep it very clean and unfortunately yeah they have to live like that so in a good market that's only usually for about a week right when we have like those offer dates and we're holding back so it's easy it's easy to navigate, but when we're in a, in a, in a market, like a down market and, or a buyer's market where it can take months for something to sell, it can be tedious and they have to be prepared to maintain the home. Obviously the other side to this though, is obviously they have showings less often. So they can kind of clean the house and get it ready for showings, right? Cause they'll have notice of their showings as well. So they have a little bit more of a window of time to vacuum and do all that stuff. But yeah, the staging and all of that, they have to live like that for a little while. It's kind of the cost of selling the house. Alternatively, you could you could ask them to move out. Um, I know Andrew Bolton, for example, from our brokerage, they move into a hotel for a week or seven days or 10 days or whatever his timeline is um, while they do the showings and they have the house on the market or they move in with their in-laws or friends or whatever that is and they, they stage the house and then it just stays like that, right? And he's got and like- he would, he would pay for that hotel for the week? No, the seller, he gets the sellers to pay, which is impressive. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I, to me, I, I personally, I, I get where, I get that strategy, I understand it. I don't, I'm not gonna say I don't love it. I think it makes a lot of sense, but I also think that that's fine when we're in a heated market and stuff is selling in five days or seven days and it's not gonna have a big cost to it. But when we're in a down market or we're in a shifted market and stuff isn't, it's going to take a month to sell or two months to sell or whatever that looks like, that's not really a feasible strategy, right? So um, at that point, they would either have to move out and move in with a family member or something for the amount of time that the house is on the market, or they would live in the house and they just have to maintain it the way that it is for showings and stuff like that, make sure that it's, it's properly staged and clean and ready to go. Mm -hmm. I think another if you, question if you can prove like you're paying like 30,000 for a staging so it would be easier to negotiate that with the with the sellers right like if they stay in a, at a hotel or something it would be like much easier but it really yeah. depends of uh, what are you providing right yeah and and what the sellers have from a budget point of view right just because just because we're going to say hey I'm going to spend three grand or five grand or six grand on staging or even 10 grand and get the house painted and all this sort of stuff. Um, it doesn't mean the, that the sellers have the budget to cover the cost of a hotel for four nights or five nights or whatever, a week or 10 days, especially if they have kids, because now you're into multiple rooms and stuff as well, right? Yeah. So it's just a strategy I've heard of. Um, most people generally would be more likely to move in with a family member or something for that time. But again, I mean, going back to the different mm -hmm. types of markets, if we're in a if we're in a down market or a buyer's market, you can't really live with someone un, un, for an undetermined amount of time. Like who are you gonna live with for three months, you know? That's a bit unrealistic as well. So at that point, what it comes down to is making sure as agents that we're really clear with our clients about the expectation of the condition the home is kept in while it's on the market and how the home shows, right? I had an instance where I was showing a house uh, for a client and we went in and then there was a tenant in there and then yeah. the owner was living in the basement. Yeah. But when we were showing the house, the tenant was still in the house. And um, so how does that usually happen? Is that like an odd situation or? No, that happens all the time with tenants. Um, 
the thing with tenants that's totally different than a, a standard seller is that it's not the tenant's house, right? So they don't care. They don't care as much. And you've got, you know, good tenants and bad tenants and the tenants that fall somewhere in between. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'll tell you some funny stories about times I've gone into houses for sure, but that's very, very common. Tenants tend to be home more often than, than homeowners. But I've been in properties where homeowners have been home during showings. The house isn't clean. I remember I showed a house one time. It was a Sunday. It was a, quite a few years ago now, but I still remember it vividly. It was in Thornhill Woods and I was showing like five or six houses that day and I get there and have the lockbox code and knock on the door. No one answers the door. And so I take the key out of the lockbox, open the door and I open the door and I can smell like bacon. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. Like, you know, there's no cars in the driveway, whatever. So we go in and I always, you know, when you go in, you always yell like hello and make sure nobody's in the house or that if they are, they're aware that you're there. So you don't startle anybody. And I hear like hello coming from the back of the house. So I walk, I walk into the back of the house, which happened to be the kitchen. And there's an entire family. There was like 10 people sitting around a table eating breakfast. It was like 1130 on a Sunday. And I was, and it was like the grandma and the kids and the, like, it was like a family thing. I was like, this is so strange. And my clients were standing with me and, you know, obviously that happens that sort of stuff happens and it can completely skew that the way your showing goes because my clients were so thrown by it they didn't even want to stay in the house they were just like this is so weird like we're interrupting their family breakfast right um and i remember another time i was showing a condo downtown with clients and it was for a purchase and uh it was actually right by the acc building really nice building uh, or right by the ACC, the in the above, like where real sports and stuff used to be, and uh, we get there and go into the the unit, and there was um, it was a two bedroom unit, it was maybe 800 square feet. The house was a disaster. There was furniture and boxes and stuff everywhere. There was a mom, a dad, a grandparent, and there was a kid running around, and the kid was just naked, completely naked, oh. just running around the house, and you're going like you know, what do you do? Where do you look? What do you say? <laughs> right? You're just like super uncomfortable. Um, and again, same thing. We went, we went through, we did the showing, we kind of took a look around. We didn't look very hard because you couldn't see anything anyway, um, other than the layout. And luckily it was a condo. So that's all you really need to see. Um, and we left, we left within like five minutes. So but if you're, if you're dealing with a seller, right, you're listing yeah. a house and they have a tenant, like what are you really supposed to do with that tenant? So generally what I would do is I actually reach out and connect with the tenants um, as well. And I introduce myself and I let them know I'm the agent and I'm here to help them if they have any questions, if there's anything that they might need um, or if they have any issues with the showings. And then I ask them to not be home for the showings if possible. I get an idea of what their work schedule is. If I have to have restrictions on timelines because they have a kid or anything like that. So the more we can respect the tenant the more hopefully the tenant is going to respect what we're trying to do. But I've had, I've had horrendous tenants in listings where they wouldn't let people in. They can't, they refused all showings. They locked the doors on people, um, all sorts of stuff. And it's very difficult, you know, in those situations, we've just got to try and navigate to get the tenant to cooperate or we have to let the landlord deal with it through the landlord tenant board and all that sort of stuff. So, so when, when, when you're dealing with a tenant, you're mm -hmm. selling the house, you have to give, I think, what is it, 60 days notice? Yeah, it once, so yeah, 60 days notice if you're asking them to leave. Um, if so, say someone buys the house and wants vacant possession and the tenant's on a month to month, you'd have to give them 60 days notice before the house can close. Um, a tenant has to give you 60 days notice if they're planning to move out. And otherwise, you don't have to give them notice until the house is sold. So you have to let them know that you're listing the home and you have to mm -hmm. let them know there's going to be showings and they legally are, are entitled to 24 hour notice of any showing on the property. So they can refuse anything that's less than 24 hours out at any given time. Um, but otherwise, until the home is sold, you don't have to give them any notice. Other than but they, that, can't, like, they can't say, oh, no, I don't want to move out. If they're on a lease, like, they can. Yeah. Oh, really? Even yeah. if you're selling the house? Yeah, because you uh -huh. can't sell the house. You can't sign a lease with somebody, give them a contract for a home to live in for a year, and then sell the house six months later. 
you can sell the house if someone's willing to assume the tenant for the remainder of the lease, but the tenant doesn't have to leave until the lease is, is done. And then they oh, still need 60 hours notice at 60 weeks, 60 days notice at that point from the time the lease contract finishes, because then they go on month to month, then you can give them notice. So that you have you to wait until the, the lease is done. Or the buyer has to assume the tenant for the remainder of the lease at the very least. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And then the, the new buyer would then give them notice saying they're not renewing the lease at the end of the term because they're going to be using it for personal purposes or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tenants are tricky. Tenants are harder. The best thing you can do is build a really good relationship with them. Um, and, you know, and a, a lot of times you end up helping them find a new place to live. If you're, if you're, if you navigate that properly, right, you can pick up, you can pick them up as a client. So, and in some instance, I know people that have picked them up as buyers because they've kind of gone, well, I wasn't planning on doing this yet, but maybe I'll look into it now. And then they end up buying a place, right? So that's, is, the more you approach them as if it's their home as well, the better, because they're going to respect that a little bit more and go out of your way to respect them, go out of your way to acknowledge that, you know, they have time restrictions and they have things that they need in their life and all that sort of stuff. And we have to respect that, right? Mm -hmm. When you're listing a house and you know that somebody's going to come and see it with an agent, do you usually come to the house before they come and just make sure everything's okay? Or are you there with the agent? No. Or what do you usually do? I'm, I, I'm usually given my clients like strict instructions on how the house should be every day and how to prepare for showings and what the home needs to look like for showings. And I'm trusting that they're following that. And I'm also get trying my best to get feedback from the list from the agent who showed it in order to verify that there weren't any issues with the house when they went through it as well as what their clients thought and stuff. But no, honestly, you don't have time to do that. You don't have time to go every time there's a showing, especially in a crazy market and sellers want to sell their house, right? So they're going to keep it clean. If it's a tenant, you know, you kind of got to accept it for what it is. It's going to be what yeah. it is to an extent. Like if, you, um, if you got bad feedback from a, from a buyer who like from a buyer agent saying, yeah. Oh, the house was not dirty, like just bad feedback. How would yeah. you relate that to the, to your client as a seller, you know? Like, yeah. Like I, I very directly, I've had that happen actually many times and it's uncomfortable. It's not a fun call to make, but um, I believe in obviously being very transparent. So I would call them and, you know, whether I do my weekly feedback call or my every other day feedback call or whatever that's going to look like on that conversation, I would say, Hey, listen, you know, we had five showings last week and four of them were fantastic. And one, we got some bad feedback on, um, and obviously we got to discuss that a little bit. So here's what the feedback was. And maybe it was that the house was a mess or in one instance, I had the feedback that there was like underwear on the floor and things like that. Um, and you, you have to, you have to just, you can't sugarcoat it. It is what it is. Right. So you have to be pretty mm -hmm. straightforward about it um, and upfront about it and just have a, a real conversation and say, you know, I know probably wasn't intentional and all of that, but like, you know, we need to make sure that we're keeping the home showing in his best possible light in order to attract buyers. So, you know, did, is there something we need to do? Do we need to bring in a cleaner once a week or something? Is it, is will that help? What does that need to look like? Right in order to solve this problem. Yeah, especially when they have pets and like three yeah. dogs. Like, yeah. What about that? Uh, are they supposed to keep the, the dog in a cage or? They... Depends on the dog, right? Um, pets are challenged because of the pet smells as well. Um, and a lot of pet owners don't really like hearing that their house smells like dog or smells like cat or whatever that instance is gonna be. So you kind of have to figure out a way to say that. Um, usually as part of the, the staging process, if they have animals, I recommend that they get all the carpets steam cleaned and stuff. And that I ask them if they have somewhere that the animal could stay, whether it's like their parent's house or friend's house. Um, and if not, then they need to remove the animal. The cats are fine, but they need to remove any dogs from the property generally before any showings. So either cage them during the day if they're going to be at work or if you're home, then go out for a walk and take the dog with you or something like that. But you got to make sure they got to be making sure they're cleaning the carpets and the floors and stuff like every day to maintain limit that smell. Right. 
And that one's a little bit trickier because again, there's only so much we can do. And if they are owners who the home has always had that kind of animal smell, it's going to be very difficult to overcome that without removing the animals from the property and then getting everything professionally cleaned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes guys, the other side to this coin is that sometimes it is what it is and the sellers don't want to deal with it and they don't want to make the adjustments and they don't want to put the money in and they don't want to do the work, in which case your price is going to reflect all of those things. Okay. Right. Like if they're doing everything at a high, high level, you can ask top dollar for the home. If they're not, you can't, you have to allow for the fact that the house smells like dog or the tenant is the house is in disarray and it needs to be painted and the sellers don't want to do it. And there's no landscaping or whatever it is that it, that's the issue. It, it, at the end of the day, it comes out of the seller's pocket on the sale side, as opposed to on the upfront side of getting the house ready. So it's costing them the money either way. Just sometimes they're willing to do the work, sometimes they're not. And if they're not, doesn't mean don't take the listing, just means price it properly or price it accordingly. Right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So once we've gone through all of that stuff and then we've gone through their CMA and we've talked to them about the market and given them kind of our suggestion on price, the next thing we do is ask them if they have any other questions regarding the, the, the home or the process or myself. And then the final step is to get them to sign the paperwork. By the time you get through all of this and you walk them through and you kind of hold their hand and they've already met you a couple of times and all of that, you know, there's really no reason they wouldn't sign the paperwork at that point, realistically. Um, and obviously you're going to either, they're either going to be signing an exclusive and an MLS listing, or they're just going to be signing an MLS listing depending on your timing. Um, and then once the paperwork is signed, you're out of there. So your, your presentation, realistically, you can get through it in an hour. Um, honest truth, you can. Most of the time, it's going to be like an hour and a half because there's a lot of conversation and discussion, right? Um, but even for us right now, it's, it's, it's been an hour kind of since we've started talking and we've gotten through the whole, the whole thing, obviously not in detail, but that's usually your timeline. So you can kind of make it happen in an hour, hour and a half, most of the time, that's what you should allow. And truthfully, you don't really wanna be there much longer than that because you, you get drained, your energy depletes, you get a little bit more tired, you wanna get the paperwork signed and get out of there. And there are times when the person's gonna say they're not ready to sign the paperwork tonight, but can they sleep on it or think about it? No problem, right? We're not there to force them to sign anything. We're not there to force them to hire us. We're not there to make them feel that they have to hire us in that moment. We're there to make them feel that we're the best fit for them. Most of the time at that, by then, especially if it's a referral, they're gonna sign the paperwork on that at that moment. But if they don't, let them know that they can sign it the next day, right? You'll follow up with them tomorrow and see if they have any additional questions. And keep in mind, if you're dealing with a high C personality who's more detail oriented, or a high S personality who needs to feel good about their decision-making process, they were never gonna sign it that night anyway because it's not how they work it's not how their brain works they need to digest the information make sure they don't have any other questions and feel good about you as their agent before they'll sign anything so sometimes people make that mistake that they try to push through the signatures um, and it can actually cost them a listing one sec i know someone had some questions on the chat so i'm just trying to open that up no it was just a bad connection i think i had a bad connection i thought you were frozen Oh, <laughs> it might be, um, my internet's been a little laggy today too, so I don't know if what's going on, but, um, and yeah, I, I put down here, it sounds like a lot, but I promise once you've gone through it once or twice, you'll see it's actually quite simple. So that's what the presentation looks like. That's what a listing presentation is. So to answer your question, Najim, from earlier, that's a listing presentation. The rest of mm -hmm. it is just content that you're bringing with you, right? Uh, um, another question I would have is like, let's say, uh, like, like, how to overcome really an objection of when, a yeah. client, um, oh, I want to, I want to interview other real estate agents, or this real estate agent is offering me this, and then this. How would you keep on like saying, okay, you want to offer them obviously everything other people are offering them, but is there no limit to that? Sure, for sure there is. I mean, um, I I would very much say that 
you know, my process is my process and a big part of the the value of it is being able to deliver it in a way that they don't really want to interview, interview anyone else. But those those objections do come up for sure. And you got to practice your objection handlers. So for example, um, if another stager is, if another agent is willing to include staging, I would potentially say, well, you know, do you mind me asking what's the commission, what's the total commission that they're going to be charging you in order to include that extra service? Because I, I provide it for free within the 5% fee, right? Um, and then they might say, oh, well, we didn't really ask them that. And I'd say, you know, I would, I would recommend asking that because a lot of agents will offer it, but they'll charge you more, more on, the, on the commission and in order to cover their costs. So just make sure you're understanding their fee breakdown and what they're actually providing to you, right? So I just always approach it from a, a helpful point of view. How can I answer this in a helpful way? Um, commission, same things. Oh, my neighbor down the street's willing to do it for 1%. And I'll say, you know what, that's fantastic. I, I wish I could do it for 1% for, for you, but here's the reality of the situation. You know, did you know when they say 1% that it's 1% on their side, they're still charging 2.5 to pay out to the cooperating brokerage. So it's actually 3.5%. Um, and then on top of that, you know, not to knock how they would run their business, but at 1.5% or 1%, if that's what I'm taking home, by the time I pay my brokerage fees and I pay my taxes, um, which are non-negotiable expenses that I have to cover, I'm really not going to have that much money left to promote and market your home. And I'll happily match that fee for you. What do you want me to remove? Would you prefer that I don't do the marketing online and the open houses? Would you prefer I don't do the staging? What, what service is it you'd like me to take out that I'm offering you so that I can match that fee? Right? That's your favorite. So that's, that's called like um, a takeaway. That's what that type of script is called, where you kind of go, no problem. Here's what we have to do to make that happen. And by the way, you know, do you know, is that other agent including all of these services within that fee? Because usually they're not, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Like, for example, like where I work now is like, um, kind of compared to like real estate, but like, Mm -hmm. I have buyers who like they want to come in and they're always like, "Oh, I want to check this place. I want to check that place. I want to check this place." They like to compare everything, yeah. and then it, it, it does get kind of annoying, right? But I yeah. can see some like uh, listing clients to be like that. Yeah, absolutely, and and there will be some that are, and you have to decide: do you want to work with them or not? That's a business decision for you to make, right? You got to remember: we don't have to hire every client that's not our job, right? If they're not a fit or they don't appreciate what we're offering or they don't see the value in what we're offering or they want it at a fee we're not willing to provide to them, then maybe they're just not the client that we're going to work with. And that's okay too, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning, it's harder to, to feel that way because you know every deal is money and income and I get that. But at the end of the day, as you get busier and as you kind of build your database of clients and you have clients that are paying you your full 5%, um, and appreciating the service you're providing and referring you other people who are similar, you're not going to care about the guy who wants it for 1%. Let him go get crappy service from another agent, right? Yeah, and I know I was talking to you about this before, but like, you, can we like kind of tell the client that, okay, you're paying me 5%, but you're not just paying me the 5%, the buyer is getting, yeah. buyer agent is getting 2.5. Yeah, you do the whole breakdown, right? Of course. So, you know, I know I'm, I know that the total fee is 5%. 2.5 of that is going to go directly to the agent that brings us the buyer. That's how they get paid. So, you know, if I bring that buyer, then we could talk about negotiating that number at that point. But otherwise, it's, re it's standard industry requirement that we pay out 2.5%. So I'm really taking 2.5 and the other agent's taking 2.5. And then I'm covering all of these costs out of that 2.5% that I'm taking, right? So yeah. you got to understand at the end of the day, even though you're paying out 5% in total, this is what I'm actually netting because here's all of the costs and here's your money that I'm investing back into the sale of your property. Yeah, because I feel like a lot of people, I was doing some cold calling mm -hmm. um, and like a lot of people would ask, what do you guys charge? What do you guys charge? And yep. then the second I say 5%, they're like, that is ridiculous. Well, and then they hang up. And then some people are like, why are you charging 5%? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people understand that we're not taking the whole 5%. Yeah. 
they don't and then a lot of people hear oh it's the average is actually four or three or whatever realistically yeah. my advice on that would actually be not to answer that question over the phone i would say you know what why don't i come over and show you my marketing plan and my fee structure and see if we'd be a fit for each other mm -hmm. right don't answer uh -huh. because the more you answer on the phone the more you're just going to keep getting that response really yeah. if they're if they're curious what you're charging then you know move that towards hey you know well I'd love to answer that question and I'd love to show you what I do and the services that I provide and the fees that I charge. When's a good time for me to come over and chat? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next thing I wanted to show you real quick was uh, the, the package, like the listing, you were talking about the presentation package. So under guides in, uh, in resources, there's buyer guides and seller guides in here. So the seller guides are kind of the packages that people bring. So this is the KW guide, um, a guide to selling your home, which is the listing presentation. And then this is the slideshow that they've also created. So you can take these and edit them. They're all the same thing. Um, on command now, there are newer versions and you can go in and edit those and make them your own and make them more unique if you want to. But at the end of the day, really, you're going to notice it's just kind of a guide, a walkthrough of the process and a little bit about Keller Williams and a little bit about yourself. And then you put your marketing plan in here. It covers what we're going to talk about today, that sort of stuff. So really, this is more of just an additional package that you're bringing as a, as a leave behind or as a takeaway for the client so that it looks like you're, you're giving them additional value. And there are some great questions in here. So if you don't remember the questions from the presentation, you can actually go through here and just use these questions to kind of guide you through the process if you want to the first couple of times as well. But that's all, this is all the listing packages. Um, it's nothing special or spectacular or anything like this that. This is something that you would give before the listing presentation or when you're doing it. That's up well, to you. you. So you could use this as a, like we talked about the pre-listing package, right? So uh -huh. you could use this as the pre-listing package and send it to them in advance and ask them to review it. And then when you get there, you would go through it with them and answer any questions they had, or you can bring it with you as part of your presentation, which is what I've always done. I've just brought it with me. And then I've gone through and just referenced the pages that I wanna reference while we're having our conversations and the rest of it, when I leave, I just leave it with them and then they can review it beyond that. Yeah, cause I can see what you're saying, like it's 33 pages going through yeah. it. Oh, it could be kind of boring with the- It's tedious, with the it's super tedious. And I've been in those appointments before, not that I did it, but I've been in them when other agents have done it. And it's honestly, it's so boring. Um, and it's all like, you're just sitting here reading it to them. There's no value in that to the client. They just wanna know, how you're gonna solve their problem, how are you gonna help them, right? Um, mm -hmm. And when people say my listing package, this is what a listing package is, this is it. Awesome. Now there are, there are other versions of listing packages, like Gary McGowan has a nice one that he uses and he puts it on his iPad and stuff, but his is only like 10 pages long. Um, and I know Andrew Bolton has his own, so you can kind of develop your own system and develop your own content, but that's, this is really all it is, it's just information. And the slideshow, same thing. It's pre-built. You can edit it and use it, but it's just it's just content. It's just kind of filler, right? So, uh, but these are all in the resources folder. If you want to download them and, and make them your own, you absolutely can. And same with the buyer guides when you're going on a consultation for a buyer. There's buyer packages in here as well. I've actually included... This is the Keller Williams package, this one here, and this is a package that I've made over time. This one's for first time home buyers, and this is for people who've bought and sold before. Again, it's, it's a leave behind. It's not, I don't sit there and go through this page by page with them by any means, because mm -hmm. even I would go crazy. They are the same, right? Like the first time home buyer and the other one, they're like pretty they're slight. They're slightly different. The first time home buyer one has more information about the process, because first time buyers would have never gone through it before. And the other one is a shorter package. It's just more about marketing and stuff like that. So they're, they are slightly different. They do look the same, but they are slightly different in content. Not much, maybe, maybe five, six pages worth of difference. Nothing crazy, right? If you haven't done any listings and then they really uh, insist on, on, on you to show their, your marketing pieces, mm -hmm or uh, what you do on the marketing side, what, what would you say? 
Yeah, absolutely. I actually bring them with me when I do a presentation. I'll bring my open house flyer. So that's what I just opened my open house alert. Um, I'll bring my in here. I have samples of the neighborhood invitation for wine and cheese. I'll bring those so that they can take a look at what those would look like. Um, and I would just I would just print them out. I have them in like a little folder, almost like a marketing folder. Um, I would take screenshots of my Facebook ads and things like that. I, I don't mind bringing all that stuff, especially if they're like a high C personality, they're one going to know, they're one going to want to see those details. Um, and if you, if you invest time and you make everything look really good and it's all branded to you and everything, it's actually very impactful. It makes you look very professional as an agent because most agents won't bring it in a completed package that's branded and everything. So it, it helps you stand out. Yeah, if you haven't done any listing yet, and um, borrow someone else's. If you don't have, yeah, just mm -hmm. talk about reach out to an agent that you know, whether it's me or one of the agents in the in the brokerage, and ask them to send you stuff, and then edit it, put your your name and stuff on it, and then bring that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically, the marketing is uh, social media, uh, open houses, and this stuff yeah. you're showing, and yeah. Any your feature sheet. So for example, in here, feature sheet templates. Like I only have three in here. There's more on command that you can edit and make. You could print one of these, just edit my name off of it or whatever, depending on the style that you like the best. And you could use that and say this is what my feature sheet looks like, right? Um, so you can when you're newer and you don't have the content, just borrow someone else's from the brokerage for that sort of stuff, because they'll and a lot of it is already in the resources folder anyway. You just have to edit it to make it your own. After you sign the agreement and everything, you're, you're listing this house and you want to market the house, like all those feature sheets that you're showing us, where do you actually feature them? Like, where do you put those in the so open the, house or? The feature sheets. Um, so if we go back to the checklist, just so I can kind of show you what happens after you get the listing, right? Um, so this is the first week after, or one to two weeks before the property is actually going on the market, your launch date. This is when, you know, ideally your staging is completed and all that sort of stuff at this point. Um, the feature sheets generally, they just go in the house. So you print them and you have them in the house in a feature sheet holder with, you know, information about the property and your business cards. And maybe you have a please remove your shoes sign. You can also attach the feature sheet to the MLS listing on Stratus. Um, and if you're creating like um a landing page or something online if you wanted if you lean into that tech side a bit more you could also have them on that on that on that landing page right um the open house what do you mean by, what do you mean by a landing page a website oh like your like own a, website a, one or a website a website for that listing like a one page website for that listing oh okay okay I yeah agree. um for the open house um, invitations or notices, you're going to deliver those to the neighborhood. So whether you're door knocking them or you're ad mailing them, um, those will be, those will be actually like deliverable materials. So you would either get those, get those printed. Um, same with the wine and cheese open house for the neighbors. If you're doing that, you would have those invitations printed and you would hand deliver them. You would do it to the neighbors? Yeah. What's the strategy in inviting the neighbors because they're they're already there why would they want to move to that or buy that house so we're going to get to that in a second so okay after after you've had your meeting you've gotten the paperwork signed you've gotten the house they've kind of got spent the time getting the house ready doing any painting staging that needs to get done decluttering um basically what you're going to do after that is um Book your photographer, order your signs to get your for sale sign, your coming soon sign to get put up in the yard. You're going to start preparing your marketing materials, start prepping your social media ads. Make sure you get a copy of a key for the lockbox. Make sure you have the property taxes, prep your broker load, all that sort of stuff. That kind of all happens that, you know, two weeks out from the listing launch. And then the strategy. So when we get to one week before, this is where it kind of, the marketing plan really starts to kick into gear. So what you're gonna do with the strategy behind the neighbors is that we're actually trying to get their listings. That's the purpose of it from an agent point of view. However, we're also using it as a marketing tool. So I do what we call a wine and cheese open house. Um, and what I do is I invite the 100 closest neighbors. So if the house is in the center, 25 homes this way, 25 homes this way, and 50 across the street would be the 100 closest neighbors, right? 
So I would invite them to what we call a VIP wine and cheese open house where they can come into the house, you know, the, the day it goes on the market or the day before it goes on the market and get what we call a sneak peek preview of the property. Because oftentimes, and this is the script, oftentimes a seller is going to know somebody who wants to move into the neighborhood that they live in and they could invite them to come to the open house or they could come and preview the home for them. The reason we do it as agents is kind of twofold, if not threefold. One, it creates buzz around the property because the neighbors who come through are all kind of talking about it and, you know, generating a bit of interest. Hopefully it could potentially drum up a buyer for you as well, but it also removes all the nosy neighbors coming through your open house on the weekend. So you can focus on hopefully potential good leads. Um, and then the final thing is that we want to kind of cherry pick and see, hey, is there anybody out of the neighbors that's kind of thinking about making a move because they'll start to ask you questions and you'll start to be able to tell who that might be and then you can kind of start to cultivate that relationship and hopefully get that listing right so that's the reason behind that um so the wine and cheese open house then the, the invitation would get delivered at the beginning of the week or the weekend before and then a day or two before the actual event you're going to call the neighbors as well and it remind them about the event, um, and then you're going to host the event, and then the house is going to go on the market, uh, and then you're going to do your weekend open houses, you're going to be doing your email blast out to your database, you're going to be um, running your online ads on Facebook and things like that, and in our current climate, obviously, we're doing virtual open houses and not um, in-person open houses, and you know we're potentially doing like a virtual wine and cheese versus a open an actual open house wine and cheese, right? So we got to learn how to put everything online right now. But everything that you do in person, you can do online. We just have to you just have to coordinate it and plan it. Um, and then you kind of make sure that obviously the photographer gets to the house and before it goes in the market, you get all your pictures so you can finalize all your marketing. Make sure the lockbox is on the house make sure everything gets sent to the printer and so on and so forth. And this checklist will just run you through that schedule of when things need to be done. So it's an entire step-by-step -step for you. Um, and then, you know, we go into receiving offers and then our conditional period, um, getting the, the deal firm and then from firm to closing, and then obviously helping that seller buy, buy a home as well. Um, but the key to the whole thing is the marketing strategy, A, being consistent with every property, that you use, that you do because uh, you do list because you want your referrals to come from those properties and you want everyone to have a very similar experience, which is why if you look through this, this is a pretty detailed checklist of when stuff happens and what gets done and how it gets done. And the reason for that is because I don't want to forget anything. I want to make sure every single, every single client has the same listing experience and every single client has the same buyer experience because I don't want them to refer somebody to me and then that referral say, well, she did this for you, but she didn't do that for this person, right? Because then you start to get that disconnect and then that person might not refer you any more people and it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Um, and then if you look in here as well, there's also open house tools. I'm not gonna get into this today because we do a whole class on open houses, but basically there's sign-in sheets here there's scripts, um, there's a walkthrough of what the open house can look like, what you can say. Obviously, again, guys, with the current climate, we're looking at virtual open houses right now. So if you haven't done any of the training online or like done any of the webinars regarding that sort of stuff, start watching out for them and, and maybe start watching and learning how to do that stuff because we, you, you're gonna need to know at least for the next month or two if you do get a listing. Um, same at virtual showings, that's a big thing right now because obviously we're not really doing in-person showings as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, your virtual neighborhood, neighbor, neighbor's invitation, you'd actually have to, actually have to probably mail them an invitation with like a Zoom link or something on it, potentially could be how you do that. Um, or you could try and find their phone numbers and call them if you can get their numbers listed, which is a little harder to do. Um, but that's kind of, for the most part, that's working with sellers, right? It's really about um, getting the listing. That's the hardest part, right? Making sure that you're tapping into your database, that you're getting the referrals, that you're when you do get a listing, that you're working your listing and that marketing plan at a high level so that you're potentially getting more referrals and more business. Every listing should get you another listing. That's the idea behind it. 
But if you're not working them hard enough, you're not marketing them enough, you're not going to get that exposure. So, you know, right now, obviously your Facebook ads and all, all that needs to be run at a high level as well in order to generate those leads. So any questions about all of that? Uh, Jen, more like when you said like, okay, talk to your database, like, yeah, at a certain level, like right now, because of COVID-19, you want to see just how they are, how they're doing. And yeah, yeah you can kind of ask for business. Um, yeah. But how do you really go by asking for business at this time? Well, right now? I mean, that's, that's the trick right now. You, you don't really, what we're doing is trying to stay top of mind. So we're providing content and information, letting them know what's going on in the market. Obviously, if you do get a listing, you can send out a just listed email to your database. They can, you know, your social media can help them see that you're still working. And if they are in a position where they need to buy or sell, or they happen to know somebody that is in that position, then they're going to refer them to you, right? But beyond that, with your database, we're not doing much. We're not asking them, hey, are you thinking about making a move right now? Obviously, that's not a conversation that's happening. But we are relying on them to help support us by giving us referrals and in order to get referrals we need to be at a, in a high level relationship with them so being in more communication being more top of mind being more exposed to them you know promoting if you have clients in your database that run local businesses promote their businesses on your social media page um things like that right that you can do to, to help them right now because basically what's going to happen is you you work on your database now to grow your market share later because as we come out of this and you've been around and available and supportive, they're more likely to refer you business as the market picks back up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you might like, that's the, that's the challenge. Like, we're not listing a whole ton of houses right now yet. The process, if you did get a listing other than making everything that wouldn't be virtual, virtual is relatively the same, right? You still, yeah. that, you still need to know the skills and, what I would recommend is you guys just, I just gave you a step-by-step -step outline of a listing presentation, right? Go practice it, go, go edit it, make it your own, change what you don't like, add in stuff you've heard from other people that you do like and, and become a master at your presentation. So when you do go on a listing presentation, you're going to get the it's business, right. you're going to nail it, right? Like I always say, and I know it's a broken record, but I don't care because it's the truth. Don't practice on your clients, right? the biggest mistake agents make so that would be like a musician going on concert and then rehearsing on stage in front of a live audience right uh -huh. same same yeah. analogy who would pay for that <laughs> nobody right why why do we do that as agents you know it doesn't make sense and yet we do it all the time so you can start to practice like you have an outline for a buyer consultation you have an outline for a listing presentation you have an entire checklist schedule of how to have a, how to market and work with sellers, how to work with buyers. You have buyer guides, you have seller guides, you have an open house script, go and study that stuff and learn it. Right. Make it your, yeah, this would, this would be the best time to really just like yeah. customize it on your own, design it, make it the way yeah. you want it. Yeah. So then when exactly. you do have that listing, it's ready. Exactly. Yeah. You're not scrambling because you you're trying to get a listing ready and you don't know what to do. Like, you know exactly what to do. The resources are here for you. you just follow the steps and make it your mm -hmm. own, right? It's not rocket science, guys. We're all doing the same thing. It's how, how we present it and how confident we are when we are presenting it and knowing the market, right? And being able to speak to the, the client's challenges. And, you know, I say this all the time too, but I say it because it's true and it comes from experience. If you, if you know what their problem is and you can solve their problem, they're going to hire you. Because most agents are going in there trying to sell themselves truthfully when they're doing a presentation, trying to show why they're the best person to hire. What, what we really should be doing is saying, what do you need and how can I help you get that? Mm -hmm. And then your listing system is the same every time. So it's not like, you know, again, it's not rocket science. It's just, a, it's just a step-by-step -step process. So if you have a process in place that you can implement repeatedly and it becomes systematic, it gets really easy to manage. You can have a lot of listings at a high level. You know exactly what the process is. When you go in and talk about your marketing plan, you actually have a marketing plan to the point that you can say, this is what happens on what day. 
and this is what to expect and this is when you're going to hear from me and this is when i deliver this marketing piece and this is when i deliver that marketing piece most agents aren't doing that either right so yeah. any other any other questions about that I have a question about the when you have all the information of the leasing and you want to put it on MLS, mm -hmm. uh, you do that first and then you as well put it in Rialto.com, right? So ML, we only put it on MLS or Stratus um, and Realtor.ca actually pulls it from Stratus and creates it themselves. Okay. And yeah. If you want to uh, post that information in third parties, uh, websites that promoted the listing yeah uh, how, is there any uh, any site that you can do that for multiple sites yeah like, there's there's actually like hundreds automatically so through the through the you guys will see every once in a while something called kwls which is the keller williams listing system our listings go on that automatically through the brokerage um and they get their listings from there get pulled to set to a ton of sites and then Treb is affiliated with a ton of sites, so it gets posted on those automatically. Um, and then Realtor.ca, same thing. It goes to Realtor.ca and then it goes to their affiliate sites. But if there's a particular site that you want it to go on, um, you can certainly just give them the information about the property. Or if they have like an IDX um, contract with Treb, they should be able to pull it directly from Treb. Okay, and this process of uh, putting all the listings uh, on the web is all free, like you never have to, to pay mm -hmm. for anything? Not unless you're using a site where you're, that you're paying for leads or something. And so you would be paying, like your listing would go on as like a featured listing and then they would give you the leads, but they'd charge you per lead. Something like that you might be paying for, but you'd be choosing to pay for that. All of the other stuff that happens automatically, it's all part of being members of Treb and being part of Keller Williams and all that. So okay. that just hap that just happens organically. Jen, um, this might be a question maybe for like another class or maybe you can create a session for this, but more about how to really market yourself and market the listing itself other than just MLS and maybe getting more into like how to market it on Facebook, how to market yeah, it, like how social, to advertise it. Yeah, like social media yeah. ads and stuff like that. Yeah, that, that would definitely be an, an entire course all, all onto itself. But uh, yeah, we could we can definitely dig into that. I don't generally, um, I in the past at least, I haven't taught it because it's not something I was ever as comfortable with. But I think over time, I've kind of learned how to do it enough that we could probably teach how to run ads and Instagram ads and, you know, even marketing it to your database and things like that um, through command as well stuff. So we could, we could definitely do um, a, a form of a class like that. For yeah. Sure. Like yeah. I was kind of playing around with it on Facebook, just yeah. like quickly just playing around with it. it. It was kind of confusing. So I can see like how yeah some people will not, won't know how to do it. But sure, I was also yeah. talking about like more about how to, read the market as well how to market that to people how to really like say hey this is what's happening or right. you know what i mean yeah like understanding in the stats and then how to promote exactly that. yeah yeah can we have maybe a session about that yeah we can we can work it in um generally I'm just trying to think um usually like the stats and that all come from market watch right so we could definitely have a class in on how to read market watch and how to how to discuss what's happening. And then if you want to utilize that on social media, you definitely could, as long as you're reading the stats correctly, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to get into. Like I'm, I was trying to look in, into market watch, but it was all kind of like all over the place. It's a it's little like confusing. The first time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We could, we could do a topic on that for sure on, on reviewing awesome. the market and the stats. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. That would be perfect. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Do you have any deadlines to, um, like once you sign the listing contract uh, agreement, uh, any deadlines to put your listing on uh, MLS? Yeah, it's 24 hours from the commencement date. So um, in the paperwork class, we talk about this a little bit more. On a listing contract, there's a commencement date, right? Um, and the commencement date is the date that the property either goes exclusive. So it's the day that it goes live, whether it's exclusive or it's on MLS. 
exclusive. We don't broker load it. We don't put it on MLS. So it just kind of starts and it's not a big deal. But if we're putting it online, if we're putting it on MLS, um, the exclusive or the commencement date is the date that the listing is supposed to go live on MLS, which means it's, it's the day we're supposed to broker load it into the system and it's supposed to be available for showings and things of that nature. So you have 24 hours um, from the time that the first beginning of that commencement date to the time that listing gets broker loaded onto MLS. So you gotta make sure you know how to do that and you gotta make sure that you put the right date in for that commencement date. Because a lot of people, at the, especially newer agents, get a little confused about that because they think commencement date is just the date we sign the contract, which isn't actually true. The date you sign the contract is beside the signatures, right? Um, and in the acknowledgement section. But the actual commencement date of the listing is the date that the listing becomes an active listing online. So if you need that to be two weeks from now, then you would put it as two weeks from now, but then that listing needs to be live within that 24 hour window of that, of that date, basically. Okay. Yeah. So basically when the listing, so the commencement date is the date when it's going live on MLS. And then when it's live on MLS, you have to be ready for showings and ready for with all your marketing material and everything. Yeah, the but, but it's what we call, you hear us say broker loading all the time, right? That's what that is. Broker loading is putting the listing on MLS. So basically oh, okay. that's the last thing we do um, in our process. So we do everything else first. We prep all our marketing, we get our photography, our staging, all of that's done. And then before, when you the, broker load it. before we broker load it, because we want it to be right, basically peak condition and we want to have all of our photos and all of our feature sheets and our marketing ready to go. And then we broker load it and it goes live onto MLS that day. So that's when people will start to see it. And then within 24 hours, usually it'll be on realtor.ca as well. Right. Um, and people can start to book showings and you'll have your appointments, your open houses, all that uh, coming after that. But that's, that's kind of like all the prep work we do is so that we can broker load. I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hopefully that was helpful, a good intro into, you know, the working with seller process and the listing presentation, but spend time in the resources folder looking at that stuff, like I said, and make it your own and, and figure out the listing, the process and the steps and understand the system, right? So that you can implement it and you can speak to clients about it at a high level because that's going to go a long way in creating value for why they should hire you. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're welcome.